Let's bow our heads. Lord, as we turn to the messages of your word for us today, uh, we pray that you would bless us to understand and to make use of. In Jesus' name, amen. So on our trip back to Minnesota and Michigan, I got my uh, personal Boundary Waters canoe trip vacation in yes, with my cousin and his wife and Carol. Carol's the bow paddler in my canoe. She tolerates going to the Boundary Waters pretty well. And uh, uh, we had a good time. It was kind of an old folks trip. It was a little shorter and not as long and not as far. And, and nobody got hurt. Now, those of you who are, are really sharp are going to interpret that to say, whoa, what do you mean nobody got hurt? Well, several of us took a spill. Like everybody except Carol took a spill. Uh, not water spills, but tripping, falling kinds of spills. Uh, and uh, nobody got hurt. This is good, right? And, and I can justify mine, right? I didn't really lose my balance. My, my sandal got caught on a stick under the water while I was standing in the water trying to load a pack into my canoe. And when I went to step back, the, the shoe couldn't go back. So I sat down in the puddle. <laughs> You know, other than my pride and, and the seat of my pants, I'm, you know, I'm fine, fine, I'm fine. <laughs> so when we got home, we have leftovers from the trip. Some of them are snacky leftovers, and, and I eat those for suppers. Uh, but here's a little bit of pancake mix left and a little dab of oil left from our Boundary Waters trip, which reminds me, uh, of one of the bi biblical stories with Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. If you'll turn there, 1 Kings chapter 17. God has had Elijah hiding by the brook Cherith, and eventually it dried up. Uh, and he had to go somewhere else because he couldn't get any water. The ravens were feeding him there every day, and he was drinking from the brook, as long as the brook had water. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 8 through 16. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, I find this interesting, because the widow doesn't know this. <laughs> she has no clue. But God has already commanded her to do this. And she's going to do it at God's command. He's already set this thing up. She's not in the loop. He didn't bother to tell her that she was in on this. Um, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please, pre please bring me a cup of water that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And I think it's about like this. A little oil in a jar and a handful of flour. In a, and, and that's all I've got. Uh, and I'm gathering a couple of sticks to go home and prepare that for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. That's it. That's all we've got. That's the end. Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up. Nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Uh, Zarephath is not even in Israel. <laughs> it's in a foreign territory. Uh, this lady has faith in Israel's God and believes the word of Elijah the prophet with very little personal experience with either one. I find it amazing that she's willing to do that. At just Elijah saying, God promised, you'll have food. Maybe she was a practical person who said, what have I got to lose? 
If I don't listen to him, we're dead. If I listen to him and it's all false, I'm dead. If I listen to him and it's true, we live. Let's go with the one that has a possibility of we live. I'll do it. I'll do it. What, what do I have to lose? So from that little bit of flour and that little bit of oil, they just kept making another cake, another cake, another cake, another cake, until the day the rain came on the earth. Another story, Exodus chapter 4. God appears to Moses at the burning bush. And if you read the story carefully, you discover that Moses sees the bush burning and then looks back again and sees the bush still burning. And then he says, I'm going to go check this out. Just a bush burning didn't make him go check it out. It was a bush burning that didn't burn up. That he had to go check out. Why is it not being consumed by the fire? It should just go and be done and burn up and burn out, but it's continuing to burn and it's not consuming the bush. That's odd. I, I'm with Moses on this one. That's odd. And it probably would attract my attention. Uh, so he went over to check it out and God said, you're on holy ground, take off your shoes. Uh, and God says, I'm sending you down to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Uh, Moses had some excuses. God kept working with him. Uh, we're going to pick up the story in chapter 4, of verse 1. Exodus 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? He said, uh, A rod. Shepherd's rod. <laughs> and he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. So you know by that, this is not just any snake. Uh, we had a, a red racer in our garden this week. Uh, Non-poisonous, non but aggressive. And we had to rescue him from the netting on our strawberry patch that keeps the birds off the strawberries. Got tangled up in that. So I, I got the snake all clipped out, gloved hand and little scissors, except for the mouth full of netting. I tried to pull it out, but stuck on the teeth. What am I to do? Carol, not going to touch the snake, and she's not going to help me on this one. <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's okay. But the, the fire department helps with snake issues. So we get in the car. I'm holding the snake. Carol's driving us down there. We get to the fire station, and the, and the fireman, he's got two hands free now, right? And, and he's using a pair of scissors to open up the mouth and get, get the netting out of the mouth and let the snake go across the road. The snake was very happy to be free. Before I touched the snake that was caught in the netting, I went online and I looked for pictures of red snakes in Arizona and found out this is a red racer, not toxic. Right? Not toxic. Therefore, I'm willing to try cutting this snake out. Right? That's I checked first. Moses took one look at this snake, and he knew what it was. I don't know what it was, but he knew what it was, and he ran. Because it was poisonous, and I'm guessing it was a fast snake. The, the red racer is a fast snake. If it was a poisonous snake and a fast snake, I was not going to mess with it. And Moses knew enough to know this is a toxic snake, presumably fast, and you best move away. Move away. What was that a moment ago? A stick in his hand. A stick. <laughs> Moses is hesitant to do what God is asking him to do. And God asks Moses the question, what do you have in your hand? Now, you can take that a couple different ways. One is, what is that thing in your hand? Well, it's a stick. It's a shepherd's stick. But the other way of asking the question is a little bit like the scripture reading where Elisha says to the widow, what do you have at home? What you got? What do you have? What do you have? And God says to Moses, what do you got? Just a stick. Well, we'll use that, says God. We'll use that then. And so they used that stick. It became the symbol of God's power. In a sense, God commissioned the stick 
as the agent of his power. We get down to Egypt, and, uh, oh, by the way, God says, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. Any, anybody messed with snakes before? Do you pick up a poisonous snake by the tail? I don't. I, I pick up, I, I pin the head first and pick them up by the back of the neck if it's poisonous. I know it's poisonous. I'm not picking up a poisonous snake by the tail. Not, not going to happen. Uh, wrong way round. God says, pick it up by the tail. So it picks it up by the tail. It's just a stick again. Now, you might test your sanity at that moment. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it's good. It, it's all real. It, it was a snake. It was a stick. It is a stick. Uh, and God says, uh, I want you to go down to Egypt. So they get down to Egypt, and eventually Moses goes in with Aaron before Pharaoh to, to press their request that he release them uh, and let them go worship God in the desert. Uh, Exodus chapter 7, the, the story picks up verse 8. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves. Then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants and it became a serpent. Now interestingly, it became a serpent. Uh, but Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. The rod became a snake, and the magicians did the same thing, apparently, with their uh, powers. Now, one thing to note there is that's serious power that they get from the other side. They can make a stick turn into a snake too. And Pharaoh watching that said, your stick turned into a snake, their stick turned into snakes. It's a draw. I'm not listening to you guys. It's a draw. But the magicians whose sticks got swallowed, or staffs and rods, they're... they're staffs were probably signs of their position and office and authority. We have examples that we've found in caves in, in Israel of bronze staff heads, finely crafted, very beautifully done, and it was a sign of you're the chief or you're the magician or you're whatever you are, and, and your, your high position and authority in society showed in the stick, the staff that you carry. Moses comes in with a plain old shepherd's stick, which is like nothing, except God has commissioned it. What you got in your hand? We'll use that. We'll use that. The other guys went out without their staffs. Now, for you guys who've been in the military, <laughs> it's like they just got all the stripes pulled off their shirt. <laughs> you are demoted. You lost your office. You are nothing. Didn't look good to the magicians right then. They didn't speak up and tell Pharaoh, oh, we just lost that round. Nope, they didn't say that. But they had to think that when they walked out because they don't have their stick. Moses' stick swallowed their sticks. They're gone. You're not getting them back. They're just plain gone. He's got his plain old ordinary shepherd stick, but you don't have your office anymore. It gets swallowed up. It was not a tie. It really was not a draw. It was a very uneven contest. They lost their insignia of office. God defrocked them right there at that moment. And I think they knew that. 
And they knew they were in for trouble down the line. And eventually, yes, they came to places they couldn't. Uh, they, they, could, they could duplicate the water turning to blood. They could duplicate the frogs. But they couldn't make them go away. <laughs> the frogs stayed. They could make it look like a frog. But they couldn't make them go away. Uh, and eventually, they had to say to Pharaoh, yeah, this is the finger of God. And after the first two or three plagues, they couldn't do any of the others. It was, it, God blocked them, and they couldn't do it. And they had to admit. Uh, now that rod, Moses used it to strike the Nile, and the water became blood for the first plague. He stretched it out over the land, and the frogs appeared for the second plague. He struck the dust, and they became lice for the third plague. And then for the seventh plague, he stretched it out to the heavens for the hail. And for the eighth, he stretched it out over the land of Egypt for the locusts to come. Stretched it out toward the heavens for the darkness for the ninth plague. And when they get to the Red Sea, he stretched it out over the sea for the wind to split it so they could cross. That, what is it? Just a stick? Became the symbol of God's power. Used by God right through the whole Exodus experience. It wasn't just a stick anymore. It was what Moses had that he could let God use. And God used it in miraculous ways. With the widow that fed Elijah, all she had was a little flour and a little oil. Now, interestingly, although it wasn't near enough, it wasn't even enough for three of them for one day. But God used it and kept using it and kept multiplying it again and again and again and again. And it carried them through the whole time with just that little dab of flour and that little bit of oil. They, they did the whole time with just that. And then the story we started in our scripture reading with the widow of the son of the prophets. who had his, He had died. And the creditors were going to take her two boys as slaves. And she appealed for help. He said, go borrow lots of vessels. Empty containers of any kind from all your neighbors. He specifically says, all your neighbors. So she did exactly that. And poured from one vessel, from hers into all the other vessels, and the boys kept bringing her the empty vessels. She said, bring me another one finally. And they said, I don't have any more. They're all full. So she went back to Elisha and says, what do I do? He says, sell it. Sell it. Pay off the debt and live on the rest. And it was enough to pay off the debt and for them to live on the rest. What do you have? Just one jar with some oil. Good says God. We'll use that then. We'll use that. What do you have? That's what we'll use. Uh, we come to Jesus at the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew 14. Uh, there's a discussion between Jesus and the disciples. Been here a long time. People are hungry. We, we ought to send them out to get some food, say the disciples. Well, they don't need to do that, says Jesus. You feed them. They don't even have any lunch for themselves. If you read the story carefully, in the whole crowd, they came up with one boy who had a lunch. Must have been his mom sent it with him. One boy has a lunch. Now, maybe everybody else ate their lunch already, and he was so busy listening, he didn't eat it. I don't know exactly how he had the lunch, but he did. And they said, all we have here. And Jesus said, what do you have? What do you have? Just... Five loaves and two fish. That's all we've got. When the disciples said, we've got five loaves and two fish, they were saying, it's never going to work. Not enough. Not even close. It's a one kid lunch. It's not even a man lunch. It's a kid lunch. That's all we've got. Not, not going to touch it. Can't touch it. Jesus said, bring it to me. Bring it to me. Give it to me. Let's see what, we, what I can do. Um, Jesus is putting out a message to us with these stories. And he's saying, what do you have? What do you have? Bring it to me, and I'll use it. 
Whatever it is, it may not be much. But what you have, bring it to me, and I will use it. And I will use it in ways that will glorify God and, and might even startle you a bit. <laughs> I, I think every one of these cases was a bit startling. Moses was definitely startled when the stick became a snake. Um, I think the widow whose flour and oil never ran out ha had to be startled every time she dipped in and there was still enough to make another cake. Still enough to make another. You can't keep doing that, but you do. You do. You know, our God is amazing in what he can do. Uh, he, he uses interesting things. Elsewhere in scripture, he used a spider web to protect David over the mouth of the cave. Pfft, nobody in here. <laughs> yeah, sure. A rooster to talk to Peter. A donkey to talk to Balaam. He used all kinds of interesting things to do what needed to be done. God would, in any of these cases, easily have been able to simply supply the need from scratch with nothing to start with. Um, God doesn't have to have anything to start with, right? He doesn't have to. He can start with nothing and do everything. But he seems to have a habit of saying, what do you have? What do you have? What have you got? What's in your hand? And whatever we come up with, I'll use that, says God. I'll use that. that. That'll be fine. That'll work. That'll work. It may not seem it fits anything of the moment to us. But God says, okay, okay. If you're willing to let me use it, I can use it. I, I can make this work. I can make this work. He uses what we have if we're willing to give it and then multiplies it to meet the need. It, it doesn't matter if it's small. It doesn't matter if it's a kid lunch and there's 5,000 men here. That's okay. That's okay. It, it doesn't have to be enough for the need in our eyes because God can make anything do it. Uh, it doesn't matter what we have, actually. If we're willing to let him use it, he will, he will multiply it to do what needs to be done. Do you like watching God do amazing things? I, I sure do. Uh, during the, the reading for the offering this morning about tithe and, and Doug Batchelor not having enough to make tithe reminded me of a lady that I was working with in Minnesota years ago. And uh, tithe was a challenge for her. She explained her finances to me, and it was true. She actually didn't have enough money to pay tithe and meet her monthly expenses. She just really didn't have enough. And, and I didn't know quite what to say, but she said, well, in, in three, four months, I'll be done paying off my car. And then the car payment will be enough that I will be able to meet my expenses and get food for the baby and, and, and be able to pay tithe. And I, I said, well, you, you test God. He, he'll, he'll, he'll come through for you. Uh, you just go ahead and do it. And, and somewhere deep in my mind, I think I was crossing my fingers saying, oh, Lord, I hope you do this. <laughs> I hope you do this. Because I'm, I'm speaking not what I'm going to do, but what God's going to do. And that's always a little tenuous. And she says, got a deal for you, Pastor. I'll go ahead and do this. But if I run out of money, I'm coming to you. I said, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's fair. That's fair. Yes, you can come to me and ask if you run out of money. Absolutely. So she started paying tithe. Right then. And the next time she went in to pay a car payment, she was in the owner's office. It was a small dealership in a small town. And he's shuffling around, papers all over his desk, and his face starts getting redder and redder and redder. And eventually he says, I can't find the paperwork. I, 
I can't find it anywhere. I'm, I'm, I don't know where I put the paperwork. But I know you only had two or three more payments. Tell you what, I'll give you the car with no more payments. Woo! Woo! I had no idea that God was going to get the car dealer to give her the rest of the car. Never crossed my mind as being an option to balance the budget. I did not ever consider that as a possibility. God's creative. I mean, like, really creative. Uh, he, he can do things where we see no way at all. He, he can use a stick to bring people out of Egypt. You know, 40 years before, what did Moses think he was going to do? He's going to raise up an army of Israelites, and they're going to fight their way out. He's a general. I mean, he knows what generals do. He, he knows how to do that. God says, nope, I'm taking away your army, and I'm going to give you instead one stick. <laughs> one, one stick for the army. It's a good trade, right? It's a really good trade, right? Is that a good trade? Does it look like a good trade to Moses at first? No, absolutely not. Was it a good trade? Oh, absolutely a good trade. They did get out of Egypt on the strength of one stick. And God, using that one stick, better than with an army. Better than an army. It got to the point where the Egyptians said, go, get out now. Go, just go. Okay, we'll go then. <laughs> we'll go then. Uh, God's power can use whatever we let him use. Uh, and and uh, when God comes to us and says, what do you got in your hand? Uh, whatever it is, offer it. Because he wants to use it uh, to accomplish his will and his purposes. Uh, stand back for the fun part. Watching what he's going to do when he uses what we give to him. Commit yourself, ourselves, our time, our talents, our treasures. And watch what he does with the simple stuff that we have and uses it to accomplish things way beyond what we could possibly do with what we've got. We can't do what he can do with what we've got. Let him do it, uh, and he will do like the widow and the flower in the oil. The other widow pouring oil in jar after jar after jar. Moses' stick, the five loaves and the two fish. God uses what we let him for his honor, and it's fun to watch him do that if we let him. Lord, teach us to work with you, to allow you to use us and whatever we have. When you say to us, what's that in your hand that we'll be willing to give it to you to use as you only can use it? Thank you for the privilege that is ours of working with you and being used by you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.